there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. In one of the deepest lakes in the British Isles, your hair stands in the back of your neck. Swims a camera shy monster that resembles a giant snake. An evil thing in league with the devil. Something struck the boat. So it was obviously something very large. And there was nothing there but a black whirlpool. It was too obvious what we saw. Confronts there's something there. In the highlands of northern Scotland, the Morag. She's behind you. Scotland is a land of mystery and legend, and it is also one of the best preserved natural environments on the planet. This is especially true in the Highlands, where we find fertile valleys, majestic mountains, and beautiful bodies of water, like Loch Morar. This little known and little used lake is also home to a monster, the Morag. Nobody knows this place better than Viv de Fren, the superintendent of Loch Morar. My name is Viv de Fren. I'm the Loch superintendent on Loch Morar. This is my 25th season in the Loch. I came for the weekend, believe it or not. <laughs> Never got away again. <laughs> but I like it. I love it here. It is absolutely stunning. But last summer, it wasn't just the view that captivated Viv. Some very believable people have told me the monster exists. And I spend a lot of hours out in that loch. You know, many thousands of hours a year out there. Well, up until this summer, I'd never seen anything that I could even, would even make me, you know, think there could be something there. My daughter and I were driving on the far side of the loch, and there's a high point just before you drop down where you see the loch for the first time at the back of the island. And the loch was like a mirror, I mean, just, like an absolute, not a ripple on it at all. And my daughter said, what's that out there, Daddy? And I looked out across the loch, and, and there were these two things. I, I did take a photograph of them. So they were traveling towards the islands, doing, at a guess, 10, 12 knots. Never seen anything like it on the loch before. But they were creating the weirdest wash I've ever seen. It wasn't like, a boat wash, there wasn't the big V coming off it, but there was huge disturbance on the surface. I mean, I've seen hundreds of boats out there, I know what they look like. You can still see the, the land, so if it was a boat, surely it would show up as clearly as that. I had my binoculars with me, and it definitely wasn't kayakers. Something very big, and just under the surface. I'll show you on the map where. So, um, my daughter and I were up about there on the track. And then as we drove down the hill, they disappeared and there wasn't a ripple left in the water. I say my daughter's convinced. There's no doubt in her mind whatsoever. You know, this is the monster. Was it the monster? One thing is certain. These strange waves on the surface of the water left Viv shaken. Who knows? So as I say, it's the only thing in nearly 25 years that made me think, hmm, not so sure. Uh, but I mean, it's been seen for hundreds of years. It's not. It's not a myth. I mean, it has been seen. Some of the some of the old local people have seen it loads of times, you know. Um, and they've no reason to say they've seen it. You know, they're not getting anything out of it at all. It's not being commercialised. Who knows? Morar is a tiny village of 250 souls on the shores of the lake that bears its name, five kilometres or approximately three miles from Scotland's Atlantic coast. It is the second to last stop on the scenic West Highlands Railway that ends its journey in Maleg, a quaint fishing village that has long been an important market for the inhabitants of Morar. I'm Malcolm Poole. Uh, I work as curator to the local museum, Malig Heritage Centre. Born and brought up here. And that's about it, basically. <laughs>
Well, it's never been, you know, prime farming area. Very shallow land, much of it covered with heather. It's very rough country. It certainly meant that uh, people in the area had to look to the sea, and uh, that's, I think, probably been a factor in people's lives ever since humans first came into the area. The, the railway to Malig reached here in 1901, and uh, from being a, a very small crofting and fishing community, uh, it uh, suddenly became an important through route for 70, 80 years. The prosperous period was in the 1970s when uh, modern fishing methods were bringing in phenomenal catches of herring, but uh, that wasn't sustainable and uh, the herring markets moved elsewhere. The herring fishery here never recovered. An economic shock that is still being felt in the region and that helped give certain areas their deserted appearance. By European standards, a very sparsely populated region. Over the last 150 years, things have changed quite a lot. People have moved west. There's no longer the scattering of little settlements of two or three families all around Loch Moder that there were in the middle of the 19th century. Most of those have been abandoned. Loch Moder itself is actually one of the deepest fresh water in Europe. The eastern end, it actually plunges to nearly a thousand feet, which is a depth that you don't reach until you're well out into the Atlantic. It is a large area of water with very few people dwelling around it to see what goes on, so who knows? <laughs> In this small corner of Scotland, where there are no strangers, the elders love to share their stories of the monster. My name is Eoin MacDonald, and I am retired. Oh, this is about 10, 15 years ago, at least, oh, maybe more, 20 years ago. Two of my gentlemen were out fly fishing on the loch, and this thing appeared in the middle of the loch. Two white wakes gone down the loch. And then a head arose out of it, and it sort of moved itself around, then the head went down and everything disappeared. We just didn't know what the heck it was. I've seen it again out here, up at the back of these islands there. There's two of us were in a motorboat, you know, in a boat bigger than that. And we've seen this wake on top of the water. It was a calm day, pretty calm day. It was a wake in this water. And said, what the heck's that? I um, led the boat up and followed this wake, and we could see it in the shallow water swimming away like this, and then once it reached the deep water, disappeared. Your hair stands on end, the back of your neck, you see. You feel sort of, that's something that's unusual, something you've never seen before. It makes you feel, oh, I don't know. That's been seen a few times by quite a number of people. The final witness on the list is Kathleen McNeil. While she was at her parents' cottage, she saw a strange creature on the lake. It could only be the morag. Well, I was up here when I took okay. the photo. I just came like over here, and I stood here and I took it from here. I was just lucky to be here at the right time with a camera. Yeah, so I was one of the lucky ones. A lot of people don't have proof. I have lived here all my life. You couldn't get a nicer place. But ever since I was born, I've been hearing stories about the monster. And I was desperate to see something, but I hadn't. So I was just so excited and a wee bit overwhelmed. I couldn't believe my eyes, really. Um, there was a couple staying here um, at my mum's bed and breakfast, and they were sitting out just on the deck, enjoying the views, and they shouted in for us to come out because they had seen something in the water. So I ran out and just directly down there, there was two, two black humps. They were quite large, they probably, to me, they looked about that size, each one, just in the water down there. So when I came running out and I seen, I had my camera and I shouted my dad to come out to see and I managed to take a couple of photos. They actually came in and, and uh, shouted for us to come out and have a look. And my daughter Kathleen came out and looked and she had a phone, she took a photo of it, and I was behind, shortly behind her. That's when I saw like, like two, two humps 
It was black. To me, it looked like each hump was about that. And the lock was just, it was just like glass, very flat. And as soon as they, they started going under the water again, there was a lot of wake and a lot of movement in the water, just round about the area where they were. So it was obviously something very large. Approximately, it was uh, a third of the way out, you know. So he, uh, they thought it was a whale at first, but you don't get whales in fresh water. But certainly that day, there was something, as, as I keep saying. I think when I was describing it to a few people, they, it was kind of similar to what they had seen many years back. There's been a lot of sightings, obviously, and I think some people are embarrassed to say they saw Morak or saw something that looked like Morak. They said that it must have been the monster, because it was the same thing that they had seen. The descriptions of the creature vary from one story to another, but we usually hear of a body measuring between 6 and 12 meters, or approximately 20 to 40 feet, with a serpentine head. The creature is capable of traveling at high speeds on the surface of the water, its several humps protruding as it goes. The first credible sighting to catch the public eye occurred in 1969, when the fishing boat of William Simpson and Duncan McDonnell was nearly capsized by the monster. Duncan passed away there a few months ago. A few months prior to that, he, we did speak about the monster, and he did mention that when they were coming back from a fishing trip up the law, himself and Willie, in Willie's boat, they got an awful fright. I think it was running with the islands here. Something struck the boat. It kind of lifted the boat over. Duncan says, and when he um, looked to see what it was, and this thing popped up, and he, it was like a big eels. The neck was like a big eel with a face, big face, he was saying. And they struck it with the oar, and they struck it that hard, they broke the oar. And after that, it, the thing just disappeared to the depth, they said. It's only a few months before he died. I can't remember what they were speaking about, and he mentioned this, which makes me believe uh, it kind of changed my mind from a big joke to, yes, there could be. So, definitely confirms there's something there. At the time, a young man captivated by nature wanted to know more. He shared with us the impact the fishing incident had on him. I'm Adrian Schein. I'm a naturalist. I've now worked on this subject for about 41 years. I began in 1973. Towards the end of the 60s, something rather special happened at Loch Mora. Their boat was allegedly rammed with a water beast of some sort, a big one. And it made the news, and I read about it. I actually have the newspaper article. It said, 60-foot monster attacks lock boat. And the story, inevitably, went worldwide. Some people from the Loch Ness investigation came over to Loch Mora, investigated that sighting, that particular event, and then ran a series of expeditions, 1970, 71, 72. And one of their members wrote a book called The Search for Morag. This book is actually full of sightings, about 40 of them. There are two conflicting stereotypes. There is the multi-hump form, and there is the long-necked, shorter-bodied form. They very seldom appear together. And that's when I took things very seriously indeed. The picturesque village of Morar developed following the arrival of the railroad in 1901. But today, it is an extremely quiet hamlet. This is the village of Morar. A guided tour with one of its illustrious residents, Alastair McLeod, former city councillor and one-time proprietor of the village's only hotel. The village is basically one street. It used to be the main road going through here, but it, the highway has bypassed it, and now you have a situation where it is only local traffic that is coming through. Well, this is a motor railway station. 
and uh, at one time it was a very busy station. We had a, a, sh a post office that sat there and a little shop back here on the right. Because the village had been bypassed with the road, the post office closed and so did the shop. And the effects of that was felt in the hotel. And uh, the hotel, of course, was built at the coming of the railway in 1901. I was 30 years the proprietor of the hotel. With it being the centre of the village here, we did all the weddings and the christenings and funerals and things like that. So sometimes the only time you met people was at one of those functions, and it was wonderful to have that. It was here, in this hotel, that villagers met to talk about the morag. And of course, the former owner of the place also had a story to tell. I was out fishing on Loch Morar with a cousin of mine and his two daughters. I would reckon now it would be about 20 years ago. And it was a beautiful, calm evening. And we were sitting in the boat. And about 100 yards away, an object appeared from out of the water. It looked to me like the back of a bull. It was hairy, which caused it to be shiny when the water went on it. I immediately started up the engine of the boat and to head towards it. I wanted to investigate myself what this was, the two girls. And they uh, got very frightened and they were shouting they didn't want to go, but I wanted to investigate once and for all what was there. And when I arrived, it had submerged in the water and there was nothing there but a, a, a black whirlpool. So I stopped the boat on top of it and looked down into the water, but we saw nothing. I can only tell you what I saw. Over the years, many people have saw the monster here and have never spoke about it because uh, it, it's just one of these things that uh, people laugh. Some people that have never saw it don't believe in it. And uh, the, the people, when they do see it, very often they say nothing. The myth of the Morag goes back centuries. At one time, the mere mention of the monster was considered a bad omen. There's been tales about it ever, ever since I was born. I've been hearing stories about the monster. The older generation, a lot of them, they thought it was bad luck. People said if they'd seen the monster, something bad would happen to their family. As I grew up hearing about the monster, it was called locally the Vorak. Some people said it was a sign of the death of a particular member of a particular family. Some people said it was the Gillises, some people said it was the Magdanelles. It wouldn't necessarily mean that, that a local Magdanelle or Gillis had died. It could be somebody in Nova Scotia or even Quebec, a descendant of the people of Mora. Like Nessie, Morag's uh, history goes back to the early Irish monks came to the west coast of Scotland bringing the Christian religion and uh, she's been reported uh, at various uh, points during uh, history. It is said that St Columba, the man that brought Christianity to Scotland, walked on the top of the mountains here, the 8th or 9th century probably. He looked down and he referred to the beastie in Loch Morar, that there was a monster in even in these days. That would make the monster quite old, is right. I suspect it's also tangled up with the Celtic mythology as well, Echusha or Water Horse, uh, which uh, appears frequently in, in Celtic mythology. You see, there was a widespread folklore tradition in the highlands of Scotland. Tales of the Kelpie or water horse, which actually used to devour travelers, dragging them into the water. A very bad thing, an evil thing, in league with the devil. Even to speak of it suggested that you might be part of the evil. So there was a strong superstition against mentioning encounters and unusual things seen in Scottish locks. But today, the monster has lost much of its evil reputation. But as areas became more cosmopolitan, so these sorts of stories became relegated to warning stories for children, to keep children away from the water, which is a sensible thing. Um, a lot of people also joke around and say that they only see it if they've had too much whiskey. <laughs> um, but there is good tales about it as well. And other people said she was good luck. 
<laughs> I'm not sure what to believe, to be honest. I suppose I've had a good year, yeah. I got married and, yeah, it's been good. So I'm hoping it's good luck, as I've seen now. <laughs> In 1973, Adrian Schein came to these banks in order to investigate the monster of Loch Morar. At that time, no one had solved the mystery of the Morag, and the desire to capture this monster has become an obsession that has monopolized his time for many years. At that time, I was a very young man. Quick fame and fortune awaited uh, this, this national wildlife, natural history problem. Could I solve it? Could I be the one? to solve it. I knew that aquatic creatures rise towards the surface at night. So then the place to be is in a little boat, and the time to be there is at night. And I rode around Loch Mora, drifting at night in the hope of attracting an encounter. I was rowing along in the dusk, and all of a sudden, there cruised out into the body of the loch a hump. A big hump. I stopped rowing. It stopped. And I began to push on the oars to get closer. And it stopped looking like this great hump. And it began to look like a huge semi-submerged head. Ripples broke away from it as it started to move towards me. Was it the chance of a lifetime? The moment of truth. <clears throat> I had to cough. <laughs> Suspense. <laughs> and it was a rock, two inches, three inches high. And those ripples that broke away from it were actually the wake of my boat having passed it. I learned then, I learned that night, there is no such thing as a sighting which does not have an alternative explanation. But of course, we don't know whether all the alternative explanations are true. It only takes one of these sightings to be of an unknown animal for the whole issue to change. Adrian Shine had no luck this time. But the residents of Loch Morar have been on the lookout for decades, and the mystery continues. My name is uh, Alistair McKelly. I'm involved in the fishing industry, lived in this small village of Malig all my life. As I say, my brother saw it. My two younger sons were aboard the boat. We all saw the same thing. Well, we're just out in a local fishing competition, which we regularly have in Loch Morar and totally flat calm, not a movement in the loch. My brother turned round and said to me, do you see these three humps in the water? And as we turned round, we saw three humps. And of course, we didn't have any camera aboard the boat at the time, but someone made a sketch just on the evidence they were hearing. But it's a good representation of what we saw. We normally fish, maybe it's only seven yards from the shore, very close in. We saw this three humps, maybe 50 yards behind the boat. And the humps came basically alongside the boat, past the boat, and totally disappeared. Where we saw this creature, or whatever, it's the deepest area of the loch, I think it's 330 metres deep. Uh, there was no boats close by us. The nearest boats were probably four or five miles from us, so... And... It was just a, a strange feeling. We, 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 couldn't, we couldn't explain what the movement was in the water, and why it suddenly disappeared. Our local newspaper passed the story on to the national press. In fact, front page of the paper it was as well. Then it just went from one newspaper to the next over the next few weeks. It says, lock up your loved ones. Run for your lives. She's scary, she's slimy, and she's back. The terrible creature of Mora has surfaced again. You know, we, we don't know if it's one creature or maybe more. We don't know if everyone's seen the same thing. Yeah, that's still a mystery. But I know there's something there. 
But Adrian Schein did not quit. Given the abundance of testimony, he decided to continue hunting the monster and refining his research tools. One of the things that I noticed, but at Loch Mora, when I looked over the side of that rowing boat, the water was very clear. And I thought, I shouldn't be sitting around waiting up here. I should be sitting around waiting down there. And so over the winter of 1973 to 74, I built a small submersible observation chamber to look upwards against the surface in the hope of seeing a great silhouette swim over the top because that a large predator might patrol along the shallow water. We could stay in there for about two hours and um, I had a camera of course in there and we baited it to attract fish and of course we hoped something larger. And yes, we saw lots of fish. We didn't see any large creatures. And then the next year, in 75, we thought that there might be some skeletal remains. Maybe if an air breather had died, it might have come close inshore to make breathing easier. And so I built a little glass-bottomed boat, uh, which we surveyed all the shallows, 200 miles of shallows around Loch Mora. Residents still remember the crazy exploits of the young scientist. When I first met him, it was 41 years ago. He, he was admired for the amount of work that he put in looking for this. And he's probably spent a lifetime doing it. And he's still looking for something. I hope he finds it before he goes to the happy hunting ground. They probably point him in the right direction when he gets up above. This is the way to where I used to have a base camp during the 1970s. It was after I'd used the little submarine. Uh, my expeditions had got a little bigger. I had uh, some logistic support from elements of the British Army. Uh, we've had up to 100 people on this site, uh, but that was a long time ago now. We came here because it was flat ground, a good launching beach for the assault boats of the Royal Engineers, which used to take my crews down the lock with the underwater television. We were not successful with that. It was fun, they were great days, and it, uh, a lot of it happened right here. Despite decades of research, Adrian Schein was never able to prove beyond a doubt the Morag's existence. He has even grown skeptical over the years, but as a scientist, he strikes to keep an open mind, and he never hesitates to return to the lock. After all, who knows? I've known Adrian for a few years now. He is a non-believer in the monster, but he wants to prove scientifically that it's not there. Sometimes some of the scientists that I work with would like to come and do work here. And so we come and Vivian helps us. And he is on the lock in the course of his duties a great deal. And so if there's one man who understands this, this lock, it's going to be Vivian Dufresne. What proofs on that class ready to go? Together, Adrian Schein and Viv Dufresne combine over 50 years of experience on the lock. And today, he returns to track down the monster. I was here each summer from 1973 until 79. Uh, oh, we did come here in the winter, actually, as well. I did some diving here in the winter. We're bloody mad then. You know? <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> see the pictures in the paper from the bed and breakfast last summer. We were staying one of the bed and breakfast just along here. It's got a very bad photograph yeah. of, of the monster. Yeah. They were on the sun deck or something, so it would have been out here somewhere. Well, what did you make of that? It's certainly in a deep bit of the lock. It's not a rock, oh. and it is something large on the surface. Viv Dufresne was a diehard skeptic until one day in the summer of 2014, when strange waves appeared on the lock. 
the two men returned to the exact spot where this strange phenomenon occurred. Where I was. Yeah, where was that's where you? See where, where the, the, the dip in the plantation there? Yes. That's where, that's where I was, just on the right-hand side of that. Whatever it was, was this side of that point, between that point and this point of the island. I'd love an, an explainable answer. So I'll go back to Mr. Total Skeptic again. <laughs> <laughs> But for Malcolm Poole, director of the Malague Heritage Centre, Scottish lake monsters are the stuff of legend. One quite plausible explanation for some uh, sightings are, are driftwood, and uh, giant eels have been mentioned as a possible explanation as well. To be honest, deer are at the top of my list. They, they've been photographed swimming considerable distances from the shore to feed on the islands. So that, that is a possible explanation. And we surveyed in 1975 200 miles of the shoreline and we went all the way around the shore looking for bones, skeletal remains. Using a little glass bottom boat, found an awful lot of sheep and deer bones, but we didn't find anything, uh, anything uh, unusual. looking for the sorts of things that people see and sometimes believe they are seeing large animals. Perhaps they are and perhaps they're not. Things like boat weights, things like what we're generating now, but it's disappearing. The waves we are making can sometimes look like those multi-humps, what I call the sea serpent type sightings. That can happen. Adrian and Viv are en route to the place where there have been the most sightings. I mean, most of the ones I've heard of recently are down this end, it has to be said, but, but then not so many people go further up the loft now. No, it's, um, it can be a dangerous place. Oh, yeah. Well, the canoeists that we lost last summer, it was blowing worse than this, and they were up at the head of the loch, and one of them drowned. And... and it can happen so quickly, too. Yep. It can really happen quickly. You've always got to have an escape plan. It can change in a second. <laughs> yes. I mean, you're not even seeing half of the length of it here. The, the sunlight on the hill and the distance there, that's about halfway up the loch. So you've got the same again before you get to the top of it. A large area of water with uh, mountains around. The wind does play tricks on the water, and on a number of occasions I've seen things that made me look closer, but uh, I always came up with an explanation for, for strange patterns on the water. Because we're lying in the shelter of an island, the wind comes over the top and strikes down onto the water, and we call that a cat's paw, and that can happen there's one, there's one. But if you were on the shore now and high up, you might see that as an animal surfacing and coming towards you with a wake. There are all sorts of things that water does which can be mysterious. Uh, there's as much rationality as imagination that goes into what people see. There's generally something that they are seeing. It's just a question of how we interpret it. Adrian Shine and Viv Dufresne are still on the hunt for the Morag. She's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep your eyes open. Well, Ewan and John McVarish reckoned they saw one in the islands here when they were fishing. And it was very calm and they saw it under the water and, it, and shot off into the deep. Yeah, this is it. Get it. This is it. Takes some doing, doesn't it? But chasing a lake monster is a bit like fishing. It's best to be patient and enjoy your time outdoors. Look at that rock down there. That's a uh, big rock. Uh, 
Yeah. It's the size of it. Look at that. And we've succeeded really well. <laughs> I'll get the photo. Not a hugely successful day. <laughs> but if you saw her every day, it wouldn't be a mystery anymore. No, that's right. The popularity of these mysteries lies partly in the attempts made to investigate them. And investigators sometimes have results. And sometimes, of course, the results are less mysterious. Although many residents say they saw Morag, Adrian Schein now believes that this monster is a product of the imagination. We are confident now that the multi-humps, the multiple hump sightings, are actually boat wakes. And that is where we begin to study the psychology of human perception. The color is virtually always described as dark. Sometimes the skin is described as shiny, as in reflective, as in wet. It was a dark colour, you know, dark greyish black colour. It was black, dark. It was definitely dark, dark grey or black, it was dark colours. But then it often would be, because when you look at water, which often is reflecting light, silvery light, uh, you see anything uh, against that background, it will always appear dark, though it can also be characteristic of waveforms. Reports of size vary. The size here has been suggested as some 30 feet or more. It was two large humps. To me, it looks like each hump was about that. The, the, the total length of the humps may have been, I'm sure we've got to talk about 20 feet or six meters. You know, the circumference they got in it. I'll say between six and 20 feet. We need context to judge size. In fact, the context that we, we require is distance. We can judge distance if we are on a textured surface, one like a patterned carpet, for example, but also if we are looking at waves, because the waves are a sort of pattern. As they recede, as the range increases, so the waves get smaller visually. And so that gives us a rough idea of distance and therefore size of scale. And guess when sightings are made? And it was a beautiful calm evening. And totally flat calm, not a movement in the loch. And the loch was just, it was just like glass, very flat. And the loch was like a mirror, I mean just like an absolute, not a ripple on it at all. Seen this week on top of the water, it's a calm day, pretty calm day, and it's a week in this water, and so what the heck's that? And that, that's what makes it harder to explain, because it was so obvious what we saw. And if you have no clues to distance, you will not know how big an unrecognised object is. Is it conceivable that a little a bird with a neck so big could actually be mistaken for a monster with a neck so big. These are explanations which are possible alternatives, though it doesn't necessarily mean the explanation is true. But Adrian Shine's love of Loch Morar, to which he has devoted decades of his life, continues unchanged. Now that he no longer believes in the monster, he's determined to prove it doesn't exist. What I did was to try and use the conventional scientific techniques to examine the environment, all the organisms at the very base of the food chain. And the conclusion has been, uh, both a Loch Mora and a Loch Ness, that 
there is not really sufficient food resources to sustain a viable a resident population of large predators. It does not, of course, preclude the possibility of large creatures possibly coming from the sea. Loch Mora is actually closer to the sea than Loch Ness, but there's a problem there. And it is the fact that you've got a dam and a waterfall at the base of the River Mora, which feeds into the sea uh, and a bit of a barrier for larger marine creatures like seals, like sturgeon, to come into it. But the full weight of science means very little to those who have seen the morag with their own eyes. And remember, there are many such witnesses. So um, I do definitely believe in the monster. I think there's definitely something there. That day, what we saw that day, it, it didn't convince me that there is morag there, but there is something there. That's, that's definitely something there. It's... Prior to me seeing it, I would probably be like everybody else and say, that there wasn't such a thing in the law. I'm not a total believer in the monster angle. Uh, I think there could be something there. Well, there's obviously something there. I could a picture of it, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> and that, that's what makes it harder to explain. It was so obvious what we saw. The more you speak to people that saw something, the more I believe there is something there. Things like this are, are probably better undiscovered. Which, it would take all the mystery out of it if, we, if there definitely was one and we'd discovered it. You know, we, we don't know if it's one creature or maybe more. We don't know if everyone's seen the same thing. Yeah, that's still a mystery. Uh, but I mean, it's been seen for hundreds of years. It's not, it's not a myth. I mean, it has been seen. Some of, the, some of the old local people have seen it. And there's no reason to say they've seen it. You know, they're not getting anything out of it at all. It's not being commercialised. Loch Ness immediately uh, optimised the sightings to become quite promotional in their attitude. That was not true at Loch Mora. Monster or myth, one thing is certain. The people of Morar do not want to turn their village into an amusement park. I wouldn't like to see more of me come and look nice. It's a beautiful place to live and it's very peaceful and we're quite happy to keep it that way. In the summer, tourists, we get tourists, but not, not even then, not, not like Loch Ness or something. We've got thousands and busloads of them everywhere, you know. And I wouldn't really like Loch Mora to become like that. I would never like to see it commercialised like it has been at Loch Ness. Although we've got our little resident, possibly, um, give it our little secret. Maybe I'm being selfish, but when you love a place, you want to keep it all to yourself, basically, isn't that right? Most of the tourist trade is in summer, but you get a small number of people there uh, drifting through in winter as well. People just come here for a hill walking. A few miles to the north of us, we've got three peaks that are over 3,000 feet, which uh, attract uh, a lot of mountaineers each year. It's one of the attractions of the area. Boat trips uh, out to the islands, white beaches to make you think you're in the Caribbean when the weather is a bit brighter than today. It's the main beaches for this part of the country around about here. The waters are very safe, very warm as well, and very beautiful as you can see. And for now, the steam train remains the most popular tourist attraction. In, in 1984, the railway company tried a special steam service between Fort William and Malley, but it became world famous when uh, it was used in the Harry Potter films. And now we have hundreds of people every day just to travel across the viaduct that figures in the films. As for Adrian Schein, he has since devoted his research to the Loch Ness Monster. And that's what led to Operation Deep Scan in 1987, which was a, a very large expedition. We did sonar patrols, and we did get a series of contacts that we didn't understand. Just because I don't understand my sonar contacts doesn't mean they're monsters, it might just mean that I don't understand. And a new theory is gaining popularity on the loch. What if Morag and Nessie of Loch Ness are the same creature? Somebody did mention uh, in the past that they're making out there's a big tunnel below the hill to Loch Ness. Because both lochs run parallel to each other, they thought there could be maybe 
tunnels connecting the two locks. And we could be having a sheer monster here. They thought it maybe it could be the monster from Loch Ness that had come into Loch Mora. No, 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 that's one theory. I mean, I've heard the theory, but it's certainly not one. It's a long way to have a tunnel. It's a long, I mean, it, <laughs> it would have to be one hell of a tunnel. I, no, I don't believe that for one minute, but... But as far as I'm led to believe, there was inconclusive, so... We've got a Mora monster and a Loch Ness monster at this stage. I suppose you could say this, that if a lot of people, a lot of honest and sober people, see large animals, and we go and look and find large animals, that's not a big deal. If a lot of people see large animals in a large Scottish loch and there are not animals there, then that is more interesting, not less.